Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for our opportunity to be here tonight and to pray for one another. Thank you, Father, that we have the blessing that is only ours, that we can come before you. Tonight, I pray my voice would stay strong and that the message would come through clearly despite my weakness. And in that way, Father, you would gain all the glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can tell, I'm a little, little hoarse. Now, it's been a while, almost three weeks, really. So it's probably worth a moment of review, but I don't really want to spend a lot of time on review in part because I don't think my voice would take it. So we're not going to do a lot. Let's just remember the final slide that we looked at from that last meeting when we went through the discussion of the Antichrist. It was the breaking of the first seal of the seal judgments, and it resulted in the man of lawlessness, Paul calls him, being revealed. And it was a white horse with a man, an unidentified man, sitting on that white horse. And white was symbolic of royalty or military honor. And though the horse is seen delivering him, we understood this horse was symbolic in the sense that it represented his arrival as ordained by God. By the opening of his seal, God permitting him to arrive and And so as we look down the list of things we learned studying about him from outside of the book of Revelation, looking wherever we needed to to find out about him, his ascent to power brings the world to the threshold of tribulation. And when he successfully brokers a covenant that allows Israel to restart temple sacrifice on the temple mount, with that event, tribulation will begin. There is an aligning of his Arrival as a power to be reckoned with and the inauguration of this covenant. You might say this is a deal maker's deal. The ability for a man to broker an agreement that allows the Arabs to forego their claims to the Temple Mount such that Israel can reestablish their sacrificial system. A man who's capable of brokering that kind of agreement, imagine the world's response to him once that agreement gets nailed down. They'll hail him as a peacemaker. So that's why these two events line up. The arrival of this man on the horse and the signing of the covenant are coincident because one makes the other who he is in the world's eyes. Having succeeded in apparently bringing peace to the Middle East. This man, whoever he will be, the Antichrist, he will parlay that success into an opportunity to conquer the rest of the world. Daniel told us when we looked at all of this that the Antichrist would rise into a position of power among ten existing world leaders, rulers. He will eventually come to dominate them all, Daniel tells us. He is said to go out conquering and to conquer, which means he obtains his initial success through a political means. Remember, he had the bow, but he didn't have any arrows, gun with no bullets. So he goes out with the threat of military power, but no real means of carrying it out. Eventually, he gains that power. And by the end of the tribulation, he's ruling the world, and he's done that through military might. We're also told in Daniel he places himself in the Holy of Holies, and when he does that, he calls himself God and then demands that the world worship him. So that's the arc of this guy's short-lived career, as Scripture gives it to us. Up to this point, of course, all that Revelation has given us is simply his arrival on the scene, his emergence. Now, we know also from what we've studied that Satan is behind him, that his real power is found in Satan working through this man's life for goals that Satan has had ever since the beginning. He's always been at work in the world. John told us that the spirit of the Antichrist has always been with us. Paul told us that the Antichrist, however, in the form of the man, cannot rise to power because there is a restrainer, or the Holy Spirit, we identified him to be, still in the world today holding back the ability For Satan to choose that man and use him as he wishes. That's grace to the world. And it's done in part because God is not ready yet to begin his program on behalf of the Jewish people. The program of tribulation, in other words. So we understand that this man's appearance 
when it happens, is caused by the Lord breaking the first seal, not because Satan finally gets the upper hand, but because God permits this revealing to take place. And as he comes to the foreground, then a cascading chain of events begins to unfold. So that's where we left off. At the end of chapter 6, verse 2. So I think that's a new record for me. We got through all of two verses last time we met. All right, let's read chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. The next seal. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. The second seal is similar to the first in several ways. What we're going to do as we go through all of the next five seals is chart them on a single graph showing how they're all related. So we're going to work one at a time. So we have six seals that we're going to eventually cover tonight. We'll talk about why we don't see the seventh one tonight when we get there. The first seal we already looked at is the white horse, an antichrist who comes to conquer. The natural sense of the text now as we look at the second seal, the one of a red horse bringing war and bloodshed, the natural sense here, as it was with the earlier horse, is that this horse likewise is symbolic. Think about it. The Antichrist was depicted as a man riding on the horse also. But we know he's not likely to show up in this day and age on horses. He might do that on a special parade day or something. But in general, that's not how we expect our military leaders to to arrive at battle. So it didn't make sense to see it as literal. Likewise, now we're beginning to see a pattern in which a horse is the constant, but there's changes in color. And those color changes carry meaning. White had a meaning related to ruling and authority. Red now has a meaning as well. So we recognize that we're looking here at a literary device, a means of communicating symbolically. It's not meant to be seen as literal in the sense that these are real horses running around the earth somewhere, but rather they're communicating to us that God did this. He orchestrated it. He delivered it to the earth. The horses are merely a convenient way to explain the meaning of what happened. They are not a literal description of how it happened. So the horse here of the second seal, what is it communicating? Well, red can be associated with a lot of different things. Love, the hot temperature on your shower, a stop sign. But in this context, it's logically related to what was described in the context of this horse's arrival, right? Which is men slaying one another. Red being blood then, a picture of bloodshed. The context drives us there. The other similarity between this seal and the first seal is the presence of a rider on this horse. And just like in the case of the first horse, the rider here remains unnamed. The use of a pronoun here, he, it has the same effect as the first time. Remember, the first horse rider was identified simply as he. And I think, once again, we're drawn to the conclusion that this is the same rider as in the case of the first horse. This is the next logical step for what this Antichrist is going to go out and do in the world. It follows that the same man who came earlier to conquer is conquering here. Now, through military might, where before he did not have that ability. And while he initially came only with the threat of warfare, now he has somehow gained that ability to to prosecute war, and he's taken that next step Now, from the Earth's perspective, as these events are transpiring, the war may seem like a very natural consequence from some political upheaval, from some kind of political dispute that arises in the world. And this man may be seen as that savior of the world to step in and help put an end to the bloodshed or in some way fight the battle and win. Nevertheless, we understand all these events are being controlled by heaven. God is bringing about all of these events. So the second seal here is the Antichrist consolidating power and beginning to act in the world through military might. Look at the third seal and see if you don't see this pattern continuing. Verse 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it 
had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like the voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. Well, again, here we have a horse and a rider. This is still the Antichrist pictured working now through the events that are portrayed here. This time the horse is black. Black itself can be associated with a lot of things, right? Just like red could. But it's commonly associated with one thing above all else. Death, the grim reaper. What do you wear when you're mourning somebody? Black, right? It's a very, very conventional symbol worldwide. The context here supports this conclusion as well, that we're talking here about a horse bringing death. But I'll acknowledge it's a little harder to see the connection initially in the text. How is it that these things, this description of the price of grain, how is this telling us that death has arrived in a large scale for the earth? Though they don't make a lot of sense to us, these symbols have great power. The writer you're told here is holding a pair of scales. Now, the way you need to imagine this is something like what Lady Liberty is seen holding up in the famous depiction of Lady Liberty. Until modern times, scales were a common feature of everyday life. You would have run into scales everywhere all the time. A scale, in its simplest form, is a tool that compares the relative weights of two objects. An object of a known weight is placed on one side of the scale, and another object, which has an unknown weight, is placed on the other side of the scale so that they can be compared. And if it balances, of course, then we know that the two weights are equal. Scales were used in that way to conduct everyday retail commerce. They were the cash register of ancient times. Commerce worked around scales. Goods were often sold or bartered based on their weight, and so it was necessary to measure an exact amount of something if you were to sell it for a given price. And those goods would be compared against weights of standard measure. So if they were going to sell you a quart of something, that was a weight measure, they would put a quart of something on the left side of the scale. They have a lead or silver weight on the other side that was already determined to be the weight of one quart. Secondly, if you were paying with coin money, like silver coins, the scales were used to validate the value of your coin because I could take my silver coins and I could shave off small amounts of that silver and keep it. And if I did that to enough coins over enough period of time, I'd end up with a stash of silver and the coins I've spent would still be credited to me for their full face value. But in reality, they weren't worth what they used to be because I've taken some of their worth away when I shaved the metal off. So merchants knew that this could happen. So when you gave them your silver coin, they brought out the scale. And they had a known weight on one side equal to the weight of a coin. And you put your coin on the other side. If it didn't balance, your money was no good. So the reference here to the Antichrist holding the scales, it clearly symbolizes the man in control of commerce. But commerce in the sense of the pricing. In verse 6, we're shown the impact of that. Sky high inflation. A quart of wheat and three quarts of barley, we're told, will cost a denarius. Now, what you have to do, of course, what we all have to do is a little bit of translation in weights and measures and value from then to now so that we can really understand the impact of this statement. So let's start with the money increment, a denarius. Denarius was the backbone of the Roman economy. The, the coin first appeared in about 211 B.C., and almost immediately became the preferred coinage for all of the realm, and it stayed that way for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. It contained four and a half grams of silver. That was the standard weight. A day laborer in, let's say, the first century, in the day John wrote this, he typically would have earned about a denarius for every day of labor before taxes. By comparison, to use modern terms, a laborer today working at minimum wage would earn about $58 before taxes. A denarius would be equivalent to about $58 today, give or take. A quart of wheat produces about one and a half loaves of bread. Enough food to feed a modest-sized family for one day. And yes, you, you can live on bread and water if it's good quality wheat. 
In John's day, if you went to the market to buy wheat with a denarius, a denarius bought about 12 quarts of wheat and about three times as much barley. So a poor family who had a day laborer's income could support themselves with almost two weeks of food from one day's labor if they're eating only bread. It's a subsistence lifestyle. It's the bare minimum, but they'd survive. Today, the economics are actually very similar. A day's wage today, before taxes, almost $60, if spent wisely, can support a family with subsistence-level food for probably several days, maybe even a week, depending on what you buy with that $60. But under the Antichrist, what we're told now is the world will experience runaway inflation for even these basic subsistence items. Now we're told a day's wage will only buy a loaf and a half of bread. That means paying $40 basically for one loaf. If bread costs $40, how expensive are things like meat or cheese or anything else for that matter beyond that? Bread being usually one of the cheapest things you can buy at a grocery store. What will be the impact of that kind of hyperinflation? Keep in mind, we're talking about real events. We're talking about events that are going to happen probably in the not too distant future in this world. What will be the effect on people when bread is $40 a loaf. Rampant panic, perhaps rampant crime, ultimately, though, starvation for many. It's always interesting to me how how little food most people have at their immediate disposal in their own homes. It wouldn't take long for the world to feel the impact of this because it wouldn't take long for most people's private food stores to go away. So how does the Antichrist's arrival facilitate this kind of inflation? What triggers it? Well, first, we know Daniel says something interesting about this man. Remember, Daniel says that he would endeavor to make changes to times and laws. The issue of changing law may be, it may be related, at least in part, to this problem. If some of the law changes he implements changes the availability of food or the pricing, the taxation around some of these items, that could be a contributor to these price increases and scarcity. But I think the more important, more logical conclusion is that he will produce these effects indirectly simply through the prosecution of a worldwide war. Wars naturally bring pressure on food supply because they disrupt food production, food distribution, and what there is is often siphoned off and used for the military or simply looted and it's not available to the general public. So the black horse here symbolizes death out of a war-induced, worldwide hyperinflation and resulting starvation. This seems to now present, as we look down these first three horses, a very logical pattern of events, an almost cause and effect chain reaction, right? He appears to conquer. He shortly thereafter gains the ability to do that very thing. And as a result of what he's out doing, the world starts to fall apart. Politically, first, economically, second, socially, third. Finally, look at the fourth horse of the apocalypse, as they're typically called. Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, this horse changes the pattern slightly, but here again, a horse. It's ashen. It's actually a light green, pale green. In Greek, the word is chloros, from which we get chlorophyll. It's a greenish color, but pale green, not a pretty green. Actually, it's the green of a body that's been dead for a while. But that's exactly what it's intended to reflect. I didn't just pick that example to be shocking. That's exactly the intent. So let's look at the writers for a minute. Now we have a writer with a name. And the writer's name is Death. And then we're told following him is Hades. By the way, that has led some people to conclude there's actually five horses. But that's not accurate. In reality, is Death a person? Is there a a spirit or an angel 
that we could go find right now and point, that's death? No, death is a condition. It's a state of being or not being. It's a description of the physical body or of the spirit in two different contexts. So when we see reference to a rider on a horse, a horse, by the way, that we've already agreed is symbolic to begin with, then the rider must also be symbolic. The earlier symbols, I believe, were the Antichrist. Now it's shifted slightly, and the new symbol is named death. But since death is not a personage, but a condition, then it must also be understood to be symbolic. What we're hearing is that death has arrived on the earth in a very, very large way, in a very large scale. And the arrival of death now is the culminating effect of the all three or all four of these judgments. Look at the progression. There's a clear and obvious connecting of these four, is there not? All four horses. There are no other horses in any of the other judgments, whether seals, trumpets, or bulls. I believe the intent is to communicate these are events that God has orchestrated and he is directing, but they're coming together as an almost single, seamless series of events. So much so that from the world's perspective, you will not be able to say this is from God. The perspective on earth will be these are the natural, consequential activities in human political terms. War leads, starvation leads to death. These are stepping further and further along a continuous path. But at the center of all of this is a man. That's why I think you're seeing four horses used and they're connected in this way. It's so that we understand these are not four disconnected events that just sort of all happen in different places. This is one man in his progressive work as God pushes it forward. So through a progressive series of steps, the world is plunged into chaos leading to a fourth of the earth dying, we're told. Now, under today's terms, we're talking somewhere around two billion people. Two billion people dying. In what must have to be a relatively short period of time, given how much more happens over the next, or needs to happen, over the next seven years of tribulation. So we're talking here about the fourth horse carrying a rider named Death. The message being that this seal brings death to the world. But then we have this reference to Hades. To Hades. Now, Hades follows death. But just like death, Hades is not a person. It's a place. It's a real place, but it's not a personage. It is a location. It is the place for the holding of the spirits of dead unbelievers. Unbelievers. In the days prior to Christ's death and resurrection, it was a place that was uh, accompanied by another place called Abraham's bosom, where the souls of believers were being kept. The two places together are called Sheol in the Old Testament. But after Christ died and resurrected and paid the price for sin, now the believers who had been held waiting for that moment were now able to enter the throne room of God because the atoning work of Christ had been done. And as Paul tells us, he set free those captives. He brought them to the throne room with himself after his resurrection, leaving only the bad side of Sheol, Hades, still occupied, and it remains that way even now. So as an unbeliever dies today, their soul is escorted by the angels, we're told, into Hades. As a believer dies today, Paul says to be absent the body is to be present with the Lord. So we go up, they go down. Going back, we see Hades now following death. But since Hades is not a, play, a person, it's a place, we have to see this symbolically as well. So how do I link these symbols? Well, if for everyone who dies in this judgment, Hades follows, then the only conclusion I can draw is that this is a death exclusively of unbelievers. Unbelievers are dying and then naturally, what follows for them is Hades. Not that another horse follows. There's only four. But that the result of their death is the next thing they see is Hades. Or as we typically say in English, hell. And the deaths are the culmination of 
not only this event, I think this event sort of tips the scales, so to speak, and pushes the number up to two billion. But there has been bloodshed and war and death and so on all along. The death that comes as a result of the fourth judgment includes sword, which means war. Where does that take me? Second seal. It includes famine, which is the result of war, we've already said, but it's specifically called out in the third seal as a result of hyperinflation. Then we're told pestilence is now added with the fourth seal. Pestilence, which just means disease, a disease that causes death directly. The Black Plague, for example, would be pestilence. So now we have diseases killing, but you can still see a connection in that to what's already happened. Disease is the natural consequence of the breakdown of society through war and economic collapse. And then finally, wild beasts, which is always the most intriguing one for me. It almost seems just stuck on there at the end, you know. Well, if everything else doesn't get you, we'll have a lion eat you. Well, there is some sense in this as well. What happens in the world when war disrupts agriculture and the disruption of agriculture causes mass need for food among a starving and dying population? The countryside gets stripped of everything that's possibly edible. What are the animals going to do? They're going to eat the people in the fields, whatever they can find, right? It becomes a shared experience. And as I said earlier, from the perspective of someone living on the earth, these events themselves would appear to be entirely natural. And yet, from what we've been reading in Revelation, we know they are not. I mean, they have a natural outcome, but their source is supernatural. Specifically, the timing and the orchestration of these events is happening from Christ in heaven. Even the number of horses is significant. Four. What's the number four in Scripture typically associated with? What's its meaning in Scripture? Natural earth. And you know that because of the way God constructed the earth. There are four cardinal directions. There are four seasons. There are fours embedded in the way God has designed the earth. And so four in Scripture is a number that represents the physical created earth. Well, if I look at these judgments, the first four are designed by God to look entirely earthly. To not have any sense whatsoever that they had a heavenly origin. It's as if he's intending to stay in the shadows, at least initially. Though the world doesn't know it yet, this is simply the warm-up act. And what he's about to unveil will soon show that there is something behind the scenes pulling all these strings. It doesn't take long. Look what comes next in the chapter. Verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe. Then they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Now the fifth seal completely breaks the pattern. Instead of horses on earth, do you notice where does the scene associated with this seal take place? In heaven. We have a seal being broken But what we're discussing, what we're seeing, is something in heaven, not on earth. John describes an altar. And since we know where John is, the throne room of God, that altar must be the altar in the temple of God. And under God's altar are found human souls, meaning spirits who do not yet have their new physical bodies, unresurrected saints. And therefore, from John's description, we just learned several things. First, we learned these are not church saints. The church being defined as those who've come into faith after Pentecost, all the way up until the rapture. But we already established from previous chapters, the rapture's already happened by this point. So anyone who was in the church has already received their new body, because remember, the definition of the word rapture is the resurrection of all those in the church whether dead or still alive. So if these are yet to be resurrected souls, these cannot be people who died during the time of the church age. These have to be people who have died after the rapture. So these are people who have believed 
but yet had to come to faith after the rapture for that would be the only way to explain their condition right now. Secondly, we are told they were killed because of the word of God and because they maintained their testimony. In light of where they are, we know what faith we're talking about, obviously. The faith they had in Christ. Can't be any other faith that brings them into the throne room. Finally, there will be more killed as they were, we were told. Because God said to them, hey, chill, just hang on for a little while. I can't do anything for you until the number of you is complete. and There's more like you coming. So this is the beginning, but not the end of martyrdom, of a period of martyrdom. And until that number is complete, the final judgment against the earth cannot happen. Now, if I take all these facts together, I can make several conclusions concerning these souls and this seal judgment. First, they're Christians. They believe in Christ. They find themselves in heaven after their death. They are Christian martyrs, as we said, killed for their testimony. They are Third, tribulation martyrs. They had to have died during tribulation, otherwise they would have already had their bodies in the rapture. We also conclude then that the souls that we see here in the altar are part of a future growing group of martyrs that must continue to build over the period of tribulation. And until that number is complete, God is not prepared to bring final judgment to the earth. Meanwhile, there's an interesting correlation between the fourth and the fifth seal. In this sense, in the fourth judgment, death came to the world and Hades followed. We know it was death for the unbeliever because that's why they're in Hades. So there are people dying as a result of God's judging on the earth, but he is selectively putting to death the unbelievers. But there is still death happening for believers too. But the death for believers cannot be coming from these judgments because Hades is following for those who are dying. The death that is being suffered by the believer, though, must have some source. Well, we've already established what that source is. They're being martyred. Who has an interest in putting men and women of faith in the one true living God to death? None other but the one who has identified himself as against Christ. I mean, you can't, you can't get around that. There's no logical way to go other than to assume that the one who is building in his power and his control is also the one who is dead set against God and his people. And those two line up perfectly so that while the world is suffering death by God's hand, Christians are suffering death by the Antichrist's hand. And God has made a point in how he's put those two judgments right next to each other to remind us one goes down, one is going up. So we're seeing a world filled with death. Remember, from the world's perspective, they're seeing Christians die, unbelievers die. It's all the same from their point of view. They still haven't seen God's hand at work yet, but it's there. And we're seeing it now given to us in John's writing by the mere fact that there's a different destination for these souls. Going to the last of the judgments in this chapter, all of this changes. The perspective on what's happening and why suddenly changes All this changes now with the sixth seal. Look at verse 12 through 14. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. In the time of tribulation, there are three separate series of judgments. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and later the bowl judgments. All three series will end in a similar fashion. The last of those judgments, in other words, comes in a similar fashion. It will always be a cataclysmic upheaval of nature and earth and heavens. Solar system heavens. Like the Old Testament prophets said when they talked about how tribulation would be. Remember, they said it will be a time like unlike any other. A time of devastation that has nothing like it in history. Nothing to compare to. That's what you're seeing here. The earth has experienced great earthquakes in the past. And it has experienced meteors falling from the sky. And it has experienced high winds and tsunamis. And we know the story. But nothing we've ever seen will even come close 
to the destruction that we're hearing described in these simple verses. And we can take that simply by what the Old Testament prophets have said. It will compare like nothing that has ever happened before. It's on a scale we cannot imagine. The magnitude is simply unprecedented. And this is the first of a series of judgments that will do this. They will always be awesome and terrifying displays of God's earth-shaking power, literally. Now, in this case, the sixth seal judgment causes these pronounced supernatural devastations, signs in the sky, massive disruptions on the earth. Let's look at them all just briefly here. You have the sun becoming black. All right, now, this cannot simply be an eclipse. I find it comical, really, that people go into the book of Revelation and seek to give explanation in natural terms for everything they see described in the book, as if that should be a goal, as if there's some merit in being able to do that, when the whole thing is clearly apocalyptic. There's no intent for us to simply see this as everyday life. The whole point is that it's not. So I don't understand the, the, the desire to try to make these things sound like they could be ordinary. The moon becoming blood red you know since the moon reflects its light from the sun it will be an obvious supernatural event for the moon to reflect any color at all when the sun isn't shining much less blood red the stars fall to the earth we're told and this is an interesting opportunity for us to apply our rules of symbolic interpretation how do we interpret the statement well immediately you have to rule out a super literal translation and by super literal i mean taking the words without any sense of symbolic meaning. I can't literally say the stars of the universe fell on the earth because a star in the universe is actually a hot burning sun many, many, many times bigger than the earth. There's no way the sun, even just one sun, one star so to speak, could fall on our earth. We would just cease to be. So this cannot mean that. On the other hand, the context does not permit us to interpret it entirely symbolically either. We've already used stars symbolically in this book to mean what? Angels. Remember the seven stars from the seven churches? They are the angels that watch over the seven churches. Well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't I just run back to that example and say, well, stars are always angels? Because what is the context? What do you see happening around this description of stars falling on the earth? The sun, the moon, the stars. When I say sun, moon, stars, do you think, oh yeah, the sun, the moon, and angels? No. When you put it in that context, you now are talking about celestial bodies. So from the context, I dismiss the symbolic of angels. I stay in the celestial realm. But I cannot go fully literal and say these are suns falling on the earth. So what would pass for celestial bodies that appear to be stars falling on the earth? Meteorites. Meteors, falling stars, we call them. So we're talking about a meteor shower, a massive meteor shower. Not your occasional meteor, but enough that there's severe destruction being wrought on the earth. So John describes something else interesting. He says the sky splits apart and rolls up like a scroll. Now, it's really hard to speculate on what that could be except to take John's statements literally and assume that God is doing something here totally supernatural to the atmosphere. It would be an unprecedented kind of thing, something for which we have no comparison and have never seen, of course. And then he says, every mountain and island is moved out of place. Frankly, that's even hard to imagine. The movement of an island or of a mountain, even a short distance, even a few inches, which happens, for example, during earthquakes, would utterly obliterate everything on it. Which is what you see when an earthquake hits an object and moves it a few feet. The tremendous force of such a movement would be something like a child trying to push a sandcastle across the surface of the beach. What do you think happens if you try to push a sandcastle? If you have enough force to get it moving, you're probably going to be just a mere second or so away from the whole thing crumbling. It's something like that if you try to move a mountain from its foundations in the crust of the earth. Whatever force could get it moving is going to obliterate it. It's entirely likely that the movement of these bodies of land are going to leave them piles of rubble, and whatever was on them won't be inhabitable any longer. This will be a level of, of devastation you cannot recover from. There's no cleanup effort. There's no rescue effort. 
where before the earlier judgments were easily dismissed by the people on earth as everyday human events, extraordinary events, but still explainable earthly events. These judgments, on the other hand, leave no doubt concerning their origins. And look at the response. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth. Now notice that first word is important. Then, meaning not earlier. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? So in response to these events, the world is shocked into acknowledging probably reluctantly, that there is a reality of a sovereign, all-powerful God who is acting in fury against the world right now. But there are some very interesting aspects to this description and to their acknowledgement. First, we notice it comes from everyone in the world, from everyone. John even includes a list here so that we would understand that it is all-encompassing. His list works from both ends of society. Kings, great men, rich men on one hand, free men which would mean the middle class, and then slaves, the least class. He's naming all the strata of society so that we would see clearly everyone is included in this. No element of society fails to see the events as supernatural. And how could they? How could they ever explain it away? Whatever hard-hearted humanist explanations might have succeeded in explaining away God's work in earlier generations and in earlier times, all of those explanations fall on deaf ears after you're looking at what's happened worldwide under this judgment. Notice also, they are all equally afraid of the implications. They hide, they were told, in caves and in mountains, wishing for death rather than to face the wrath of God. And that leads to the most interesting detail in John's description. The world's population recognizes God is acting both in the person of the Father on the throne and in the second person of the Trinity, in the Lamb. Now, it's one thing to witness dramatic worldwide events like we've seen described and come to a recognition that this is from God. But it's another thing altogether for the world to come to a specific understanding that there is a God, the Father, and also a God, the Son, the Lamb, who is bringing these events about. To actually know that. How do they figure that out? I mean, how would you figure that out? Remember the splitting of the sky? What if the splitting and the rolling back of that sky was intended to reveal for just a moment a window into the heavenly throne room? And for just a moment, perhaps the entire world saw a glimpse of the same vision that John describes in chapters 4 and 5. Of a throne room with God on the throne. And remember, they described this second person as a lamb. Standing. Well, even if you knew there was a second person, how do you get to that next step and call him a lamb? It seems too specific to the description in chapters 4 and 5. Just as men of old fell to the ground in abject fear whenever they came to an encounter with the living God, that's the natural response you always see, or when you see Isaiah, for example, transported up into the throne room in Isaiah's book, he's in that same prostrate position, fearful. It seems to fit, therefore, that the world's reaction in naming God, naming the Lamb, and hiding in caves and calling out for death, for they fear for the wrath of God and the Lamb, that all fits in the pattern of having seen a vision of the heavenly throne room. It would make more sense, frankly, for why the sky is rolling back. It also explains why he has taken his time in revealing the source of all these judgments. He brings the world to a state in which the severity of their life and the, and the seriousness of the calamities they're suffering under brings a focus of mind and attention so that when the real disasters start to happen and the sky rolls back, there's just no doubt anymore. They see it for what it is and they call it what it is. But lastly, and maybe the most fascinating thing of all, there are zero signs of repentance. None mentioned. Later we'll be told there, in fact, is no repentance. They have recognized God, seen Him, seen the Lamb, have understood their jeopardy before Him, 
are calling for their own death because they're so afraid of facing him, which is ironic because when you die, you face him. Yet they do not find that a compelling reason to trust in him and his word. And by that simple example, we come back to something we've studied here in the past, especially if you were here in the Romans class with me. Faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. Hearing which comes itself from the word of God. Even a supernatural disaster followed by visions of God in the heavenly throne room cannot substitute for faith in the heart, which God alone can produce. Nevertheless, in the next chapter, we do see God at work bringing faith into the world. And so as we end tonight, I want to put a framework in the room for us, a map that will guide us as we move out of these judgments into the chapters that follow. I want us to understand the relationship between the judgments. We've just studied six of the seven sealed judgments. And you're looking at this wondering, well, where's the seventh? Why hasn't it been mentioned in the text? There is a seventh judgment, just as there will be seven trumpets and seven bowls. But these judgments are all connected to one another in a very peculiar way. The seventh seal is the seven trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet is the seven bowl judgments. So there are six unique judgments in each series. The seventh of the first two series is really the start of the next series. My favorite example of how to picture this are those little Russian dolls. If the seals were the outer doll and I open it up and I pull out the inner doll, that's like the seventh coming out of the seven seals. The seventh seal actually starts a whole other series of judgments, the trumpets. And then if I pull one out of that, then I get the bowl judgments. God, when he opens the seventh seal, is going to be setting out a cascade of activity that will follow. But until the seventh seal is broken, the remaining judgments are on pause. Until you open that seventh seal, until you get to the point of this seventh seal, none of this stuff can start. But once I open the seventh seal, all of this has to start. Because the seventh seal includes everything that comes after it. So there is a pause of sorts, and we don't know how long this pause lasts in real time, but there is a pause in the narrative, certainly, at this point, where before the seventh seal is broken and the rest of these events begin to cascade forward, there is some unfinished business, so to speak, that God wants to present in this account. And that's chapter 7. Chapter 7 is going to be an opportunity for us to see how we got those believing martyrs in the time of tribulation in the first place. Because that should have been a question you had as you came to that part of the seal of judgments. Where did these believers come from? If everyone who was a believer was taken off the earth at the point of the rapture, who was it who told these people about Christ? And even more importantly, if the Spirit of God has been removed from the earth, and yet now we see belief again on the earth, it stands to reason that the Spirit is active again on earth. He has gone back to his role of bringing conviction and bringing faith. But there is still the expectation that he works through men. I mean, there's nothing to tell us to this point that he's doing it any differently than he's ever done it. So we're left wondering, where has all this started again? What's the seed that begins this? Who are the first fruits of tribulation? Chapter 7 gives us that. So chapter 7 is that moment in which we hear how God has put aside this plan just long enough to ensure that another plan is given a chance to grow and, and, and move forward. That is the plan in which he brings glory to himself through yet another generation of believers on the earth. Not the church. This is a different group. They share in the same eternal inheritance in that they will be in the kingdom with us, but they are separated from the church. They are not the bride of Christ. They play a different role, just as the Old Testament saints also are not the bride of Christ and play a different role as well. Before this long, involved course is over, we will have talked about the roles of both the tribulation saint and the Old Testament saint and how they're working together with the church saints as we enter into the kingdom. And then with each of these judgments coming to a conclusion, there will be another insertion or pause for related material. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you kept me strong enough to preach through this hour. And thank you, Father, that you gave enough patience in the room that others would care to listen that long. And thank you most of all, Father, for the revelation of your word. 
for the assurance that we will not suffer through these judgments, for we are not appointed to wrath, but like, but by the same token, Father, the assurance that they will happen, that your word will be uh, accomplished, Father, and that we can trust that all that you have said will be true. For not only are, are these things part of your word, Father, but so are the many glorious promises that are ours. So if we accept some of it, we must accept all of it. But by knowing it and by understanding it, by recognizing the urgency of the time, I also pray, Father, it stimulates us to be uh, more bold, be more uh, urgent in our preaching of Christ and in our willingness to invite others to know what we know. And not let another day pass, Father, for it may be the last day. And let us come back next week if it be your will. We'd love to finish this study, Father, so that we may deliver it to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.